Hello world, it's Siraj, and today I'm gonna to go over Ethereum. That is the second biggest cryptocurrency behind Bitcoin that lets us do incredible things. The demo that I'm going to build in this episode is a decentralized conference ticket purchasing web app. Let me show you what it looks like. It's very simple. You can buy a ticket, you can refund a ticket, you can create a wallet, but the only functionality that we really care about is buying a ticket. So if we have some ticket price, I can input some address, so that is my address, and I can buy a ticket with the money that I have. And then the amount of registrants increases by one. It's a very simple web app that lets you buy tickets for a conference, but it's decentralized. What benefits does decentralized offer in this case? Very few benefits. One, you don't have to worry about a third party taking a fee, so it's cheaper for both parties. And two, it's censorship resistant, which isn't that big a deal for a conference ticket web app. But the point is to talk about Ethereum and learn how contracts and the model view controller architecture of web apps all play together, okay? So first of all, what is Ethereum? So Ethereum is a platform to easily build decentralized applications using blockchain technology. So we know that Bitcoin was the first blockchain application and Ethereum does to applications what Bitcoin did for money, that is removes the need for a trusted third party. So for the Bitcoin blockchain, we had blocks and these blocks are just uh, are just objects, right? That store data. It's basically, the blockchain is basically a glorified linked list, okay? That's stored on every everybody's computer. And the Ethereum blockchain is very similar, except it's different in that what's stored in those blocks are not just transactions. You can also store code snippets in those blocks, smart contracts. That's really the key bit here. Ethereum is a programmable blockchain, while Bitcoin isn't. Well, Bitcoin does have its own scripting language, but it's not as awesome or complete or capable as Ethereum's. And that's for security reasons. But anyways, you can build decentralized applications and you might be asking a decentralized what? A decentralized application looks kind of like this. It's a different stack entirely. So at the bottom, we have a blockchain and a blockchain allows for a de decentralized consensus over application level constructs. There are so many things in an app that different parties need to agree upon. Is this a valid username? Is this a valid identity? Is this a valid address? Is this a valid reputation score? Is this a valid Valid tweet is this a valid owner is this a valid owner of this data you need consensus right if we had a server there's no need for consensus right there's no democracy it's a dictatorship and the server controls everything but in a decentralized application we need consensus and the blockchain was really that missing ingredient to reach consensus in a distributed decentralized way so at the bottom of the stack is the blockchain and 2.0 means the ethereum blockchain or any blockchain that allows for smart contracts on top of that, we have a storage layer, right? Normally we use AWS, we use Google Cloud. There are a bunch of service providers for storing your data in the cloud that are controlled by one entity. But in this case, we want a decentralized version of storage that is peer-to-peer -peer owned by no entities. And IPFS, the interplanetary file system, is one great example of that. On top of the storage provider, comes the smart contracts. So the smart contracts are code snippets that live on the blockchain. They are decentralized computation. While storage and content delivery is decentralized by IPFS, computation is decentralized by the Ethereum blockchain's smart contracts. On top of that, then we could start adding application level constructs, identity, reputation, attention, AIs. And on using all of this, we can create a DAP or a decentralized application. It doesn't depend on any specific party existing, and it's not about one party selling its services. It's more about a network, a community of people who all share in ownership of some piece of software. And so everybody profits and everybody contributes in some way. It's a more communal, more progressive way of building software that is emerging and will soon be the mainstream way to build software. What are some examples of dApps? I'm sure there are a lot. There are, there are quite a few. Check, check this one out. So WaveFund is one. So WaveFund is a decentralized Kickstarter, right? We know how Kickstarter works. It's all about crowdfunding. And WaveFund uses smart contract technology to let people crowdfund certain applications or projects or really anything like that. Uh, that's one example. Another one is Augur, which is pretty interesting because it's all about uh, forecasting, right? About getting rewarded for your predictions. 
and it's controlled by no party and it's all, it's all publicly verifiable. All the bets, all the amount of funds, it's all publicly verifiable. There is no trust involved, which is a great use case. Provenance is another one. So provenance is all about making supply chains transparent. If you're a business and you're getting some kind of uh, ingredient or some kind of tool from some third party company and you wanna know what's in that and you wanna know where it's been and who created it, instead of having to trust that company, you can verify all of that publicly on a blockchain because every product has a story. What a great tagline, right? That's some, that's some good marketing right there. But empowering the whole supply chain for everybody, it's a win, 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 win situation. So great use case here. But there are lots. Those were just three that I just kind of randomly picked. There's a lot and there's a lot more to come. So let's get to the architecture of Ethereum, right? So Ethereum uh, is it it provides the uh, consensus layer okay so it provides both the consensus layer the economic layer and the blockchain services layer so the bottom three layers ethereum kind of uh, it solves right so for consensus like I said we need some way to agree upon all of these application level constructs on top of the consensus mechanisms we need some kind of economic token to incentivize all of these nodes to do the computation or do the storage or to do whatever Whatever is necessary right and so that's where the crypto tokens come into play on top of that we can start offering services right these are these are these are code snippets that actually do things name registry smart contracts messaging oracles distributed hash tables for storing data right on top of that we have interoperability so in this decentralized world where we are just imagining all of these different apps and they all have their own tokens how are you supposed to exchange value between all of these token silos well the answer is to have a universal wrapper around all cryptocurrencies such that there is one currency that you have to deal with and you don't have to think about any other currency whether that's your state currency or whether that's bitcoin or whatever it is and under the hood this protocol this exchange protocol would transfer value or transmit value between all of these different tokens at, as you use different services right so you can think of kind of a lay a stack of decentralized api that all use their own token you pay this you pay the top API with whatever token you want and it pays all the other API's and the tokens that they require using this kind of decentralized exchange protocol which you can just use in your app and there's a lot of them uh, stellar is a great one the stellar protocol uh, but there are a lot and on top of all of this we have the browser right this is how we access the decentralized applications now ideally the mainstream browsers that we know and love Chrome Firefox, Internet Explorer, no, I'm just kidding. That one really sucks. Uh, Opera, they would accept these decentralized protocols natively so we wouldn't have to create another browser. And hopefully, I think they will very soon. But in the meantime, we have browsers that are made for decentralized applications like Mist and Maelstrom and all these other ones. And once we have all of that, then we can build dApps on using all of this technology. Uh, just scratch out Store J though because those guys have been vaporware forever. But everything else looks good. Open Bazaar is dope. And DAOs and all of this stuff. But Store J, come on, show, show, show us what you got. Right, so like I said, we wanna store the data in IPFS, right? You, you don't wanna store data directly in the blockchain because it's too big, right? Every miner has to download a copy of this blockchain, all the transactions, and that includes code and whatever else is in those transactions. But if we're storing movies and really big files in the blockchain, that thing's gonna get way too huge, so no one's gonna be able to download all of it, right? So the way to fix that is to store it in some distributed hash table like IPFS what what IPFS gives back is a hash a content address for all of that content and that is what we store in the blockchain right so we store it in a distributed hash table get back the hash and store that hash in the blockchain which then points to the data storage right so in terms of the architecture, the Ethereum white paper is quite, is quite extensive and there's a lot happening here in this huge diagram, but let's go over it a little bit, right? So with the Ethereum blockchain, you have blocks and these blocks are all linked together and inside each block is a list of transactions and all of those transactions contain state and other programmable uh, 
parameters. So what the Ethereum blockchain does is it's stored on every miner's computer. It currently uses the proof of work algorithm to verify all to verify the entire network and inside each of these blocks they run the computation the smart contract contained in each block and then once that computation has been successfully uh, done on each miner's computer the whole network will do the same thing and then the majority of the network if they can agree on the computation of that code snippet it is then added to the blockchain as an immutable construct so let's, so I mean, there is so much that we could talk about when it comes to blockchains and, and all this stuff, and in, in particular, the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, but next week, I'm starting this reinforcement learning course. So I, this is really the last week of blockchain stuff before we get into some reinforcement learning stuff. I'm gonna keep my lips closed on that one. But there is one thing that I, I do wanna talk about, and that is the Merkle tree data structure. So notice that inside of each block, there is a, there is a tree, right? There is a Merkle tree. So it looks kind of like this. This is the Bitcoin blockchain, right? Like I said, it's a glorified singly linked list. It's got a pointer to the previous hash uh, of, the, of the previous block. It's got a nonce to ensure uh, novelty right a number only used once it's got a timestamp and then it's got a Merkle root so the Merkle root is the head node of a tree a Merkle tree so you might be thinking wait a second why can't a block just store a bunch of transactions as a list well in, into one big block header why does it have to store it as a tree well the answer is if we just stored it all as one big list that would provide some that would that would cause some huge scalability issues so to get around this, the Merkle tree data structure is used, which is a way to hash a large number of chunks of data together, which relies on splitting the chunks into buckets. And each bucket only contains a few, a few chunks. So it's hashes all the way down the chain. And you could think of this kind of like a file directory, right? You have the root directory, you have child directories, and it just keeps going. And the reason we use a Merkle tree is because it allows for Merkle proofs, which consists of a chunk, the root hash of the tree, and the branch consisting of all the hashes going up along the path from the chunk to the root. And so anyone reading that proof can verify that the hashing is consistent going all the way up to up the tree so uh, the Bitcoin so the Bitcoin blockchain uses a very simple Merkle tree right and it's got these parameters but the limitation of that Merkle tree is that it can't prove anything about the current state that means who's holding some digital asset name registrations the status of some financial contract and so what the Ethereum blockchain does is it modifies that Merkle tree to store and stores not and stores not just one Merkle tree, but three trees for three kinds of objects. Transactions, receipts, which are essentially pieces of data showing the effect of each transaction, and state, which is the state of your code, right? It's a decentralized computer that can store state. And they call this instead a Patricia tree, not a Merkle tree, because it's modified to store state which then allows clients to easily make and get verifiable, verifiable answers to queries like tell me all the instances of an event of type X, like that an X could be a crowdfunding contract reaching its goal, et cetera, right? So the Patricia tree allows, for, to store, allows a blockchain to store state. So there's a lot, right? So if we look at the Ethereum GitHub, there are so many repositories there, but really there are three key bits here, right? You have the Ethereum virtual machine, which calculates elements that run contract logic. Now this is kind of encapsulated by the Ethereum client. Then you have Swarm, which is the storage layer, which we can just use IPFS for. And then Whisper is for all the nodes to be able to message each other. And for that, we can actually also use IPFS. So really all you need are Ethereum and IPFS. IPFS. And so to run Ethereum, you can just download the client yourself, just like you would BitTorrent or Bitcoin. And then with that client, you can connect to the Ethereum network. You can explore Ethereum's blockchain, run smart contracts, mine new blocks, the whole deal, right? So the, so the client is our gateway into the Ethereum network, whoever you are. And so if we, if we think about all of the pieces here, you have ETH, or Ether, which is the inbuilt currency, it's the cryptocurrency itself. You have the Ethereum virtual machine, which allows for decentralized computation like Heroku. 
IPFS and IPFS for storage and for communication. You have smart contract programming language, and the, really the, the one that we ca should care about is Solidity, which is very similar to JavaScript, and it's currently the most popular of them. And then you have the client, of course, uh, uh, Geth, which is in Go, you have ETH, which is in C++, and you have PyETH app, which is written in Python. But the best one is Go. So Go was a language created by Google to handle distributed computing. They, in fact, upgraded from C++ to Go. So uh, because it was it, it was more efficient for the for, it was more efficient for computing on Google's huge distributed uh, computing stack. So if Google uses it, you know it's a good language and. Go is just a beautiful language. If, you, if you've never looked at it before, I would highly recommend checking out Go. It's really a beautiful language. That it's, it's pretty new. Uh, it was designed with a lot of the elements of distributed computing and even decentralized computing in mind. It's currently the uh, Ethereum client that is getting the most activity. And it's just, it's just great practice practice because I think we're going to start seeing a lot more artificial intelligences and a lot more uh, fundamental architectures being built with Go. Right, so Geth is the one to, to, to look at. And then you've got the smart contract languages. Uh, you've got LLL, which is kind of like Lisp, which no one uses. Uh, Serpent, which used to be similar, which is similar to Python. And then Solidity, Solidity, which is the most popular and it's very similar to JavaScript. And it's the one that we'll use. So there's a workflow for deploying smart contracts. The first step is to download your Ethereum node, and then you write your Solidity code and then compile it, usually using a framework like Truffle. And then you can deploy your contract to the network. And then once you've deployed your contract to the network, then you can call that contract using web3.js, which is the front end client that speaks to the Ethereum blockchain, right? So the idea is that, you know, when you're writing these web apps, you have this model view controller architecture, right? Model view controller. We're all familiar with that. It's like Ruby on Rails uses it and Angular and all of these apps. So, and all these software stacks. So in, in, in the case of decentralized applications, the controller is instead of speaking to a server, it's speaking to blockchains and to distributed hash tables. In terms of the model, that kind of stays very similar. But you also have this other type of model, and that model is the smart contract. You can kind of think of smart contracts like models that the controller will speak to. And the same kind of uh, logic applies when building here. We need smart models, thin controllers, and dumb views. And your views are your HTML and CSS and JavaScript files, right? So. All of the storage is happening in IPFS, this distributed storage network, and the application level constructs, those are usernames, anything that you need to, people to agree upon, right? Game scores, all of that is stored on the blockchain. And uh, we can use smart contracts to, to help facilitate that. So let's just get started with building this app, right? So in order to uh, run this code that I'm gonna show you, there's very, very few steps. All right, so our first step is to use NPM, the Node Package Manager, and using it, we can install the test RPC chain, which is the test blockchain, right? So this is a blockchain we can use for development purposes that we can spend fake money on and no real money is used so it's super useful for us. And once that in, that's installed, we can install Truffle. So Truffle is a smart contract framework that offers templates for smart contract building. So you don't have to start from scratch, right? There's scaffolds that you can use to build software faster. And once I've installed Truffle, then we can go ahead and run the test RPC chain uh, directly in terminal in its own console window. Once test RPC is running, then we can go ahead and run Truffle compile on our code and then truffle migrate, truffle test, and then truffle serve. But there's there's one thing that I wanna do first. If we look at our app, we can see the in HTML, all of the uh, constructs that we created right here, right? So buy a ticket, refund a ticket, create a wallet. We can see them in all of these sections and they are calling JavaScript, right? So JavaScript would be uh, the buttons here and JavaScript, the JavaScript is identified by the IDs. If we look in the JavaScript, we can see the application, uh, the, the app.js, which contains all of the uh, code, right? So when we initialize a conference, we are calling these functions on these objects, right? So these functions from my conference instance are from the smart contract directly, right? So these are functions that we embed in the smart contract, the my conference instance. Think of it like a class, right? So the, the smart 
smart contract is a class and we can call all the functions that we write right inside the contract directly from app.js because we're using web3.js the framework for talking to the ethereum blockchain so it's pretty simple so we would just have to write out our smart contract like so right so let's write out our smart contract for the conference and then we can run it it's just like a class right so we'll say all right what are our uh, what are our global uh, values here? We, we have an address for the public, for the organizer of the contract. We have some sort of mapping, right? Because we want an address to map directly to an integer value, right? It's because that integer value represents the uh, number of registrants that were paid, right? We want to keep track of this stuff. And then under that, we want two more variables, one for the number of regist registrants and then one for the and then one for the and then one for the quota like how much what is our maximum limit of uh, tickets that we will let people buy then we'll have a function for the deposit so we can log the event right so we want to log how much is being deposited into this smart contract and we have those parameters in place for that one more uh, event which is for uh, refunds, right? We're going to log how many refunds are being processed here, right? From what address are they coming from, the amount, and then the type, which is an integer. We can then construct our function using this constructor function. We can then construct our conference using the constructor function. So it's a function conference, and then we can go ahead and initialize those variables that we defined beforehand. We're getting some message from whoever sends the transaction to this smart contract. We have a set quota that is initialized as zero, and then we have a number of registrants that starts off as zero. Is, uh, quota is 100, and then number of registrants is zero. Under that, we can go ahead and finally write our buy ticket function, right? This, this function is gonna let anybody buy a ticket. And like I said, we can call this function directly from app.js. So we'll say initialize conference, and then we can run conference.buyTicket. And so whenever someone clicks on buy ticket, it would then call this contract directly, just like that, right? So then we can say, well, if the number of, so we'll start off the uh, function by saying, if the number of registrants is greater than the quota that we have in place, then okay, th we need to th we need to go ahead and write a throw statement, which will ensure that the funds will be returned. All right, so that's it for our contract. Very simple stuff, right? And then, like I said, we can call this contract from app.js, and it's going to run the contract just like normal. Okay, so uh, that's a demo. I hope you liked learning about Ethereum. There's so much more I could talk about. There's uh, some great links in the video description, and I hope you like watching this video. If you find this stuff interesting and you want to see more, go ahead and hit the subscribe button for now. Now, I've got to go invest in myself and not any other cryptocurrency for the moment. So, thanks for watching.